Well, yeah, hello and thanks for coming on the webinar today, everyone. And as Greg mentioned, I'll be going through forage budgeting. So I just wanted to present a bit of an overview of the concepts and why we forage budget and then how it might fit in with your system to help balance pasture growth with stock numbers. So we'll get started. Um, so I'm not going to get in depth on the calculations today as that can probably take an hour in itself, but I will go through some and I'd really urge you after the webinar if you'd like some more assistance with it all um, to perhaps call one of your local DAF extension officers and they can help you get started a little bit more. Um, so today I'll basically cover where the forage budget fits in the bigger scheme of things, adult equivalents and dry sheep equivalents for anyone listening that have sheep, some of the um, more southern guys how to do a forage budget, how forage budgets can link in with animal performance targets, and then some resources to um, further assist. So I just want to start with a big picture, grazing land condition. So land condition and maintaining it or improving it if need be, is basically the main aim of any property, as well as putting on putting weight on stock and obviously getting production outcomes. Um, but without good land condition, this can't happen. So Land condition is defined as the capacity of grazing land to respond to rain and produce useful forage. So how well those tussocks or desirable grass species will grow when you have rainfall and how quickly they'll respond and what kind of bulk of feed they'll give you. Um, so it's a measure of how well the grazing ecosystem is functioning. So basically land condition is measured by two components, your soil condition, and your pasture condition. So if the soil is unstable or eroding, etc., then you can't grow as much grass, obviously. Um, if your pasture condition generally looks at the types of species you have in the pasture, so are they 3 p species, are they palatable, productive and perennial? And then your density of tussocks or grasses in the paddock, so is there a lot of intertussock spaces or are they quite tightly um, packed together? And tree density is often also mentioned in relation to land condition, but we don't really count it when assessing, assessing land condition because we see the effect on pasture condition when the density of trees starts to reduce pasture growth. So we factor it in through that. So just these two components. And both of these basically are what, are, what affect your ability to grow grass in your paddock. So when we assess land condition, we generally assign it to one of four stages, so A, B, C or D. Um, land in A condition is at its best, so it has 100% capacity to grow grass and carry stock. And B is slightly lower, it's probably about 75% of its potential. And then C is further down at 45% of that potential to grow grass and run stock. And then D is way down near 20%. So this illustration here is basically trying to show the ease of moving between the various land condition points and you know that's what we call the rolling ball model. Um, land condition in A is relatively stable and you can move from A to B and back again pretty easily and you can do this with more simple things like spelling country and reducing stocking rates and sometimes you can't help a little bit of a slide from A to B so for many in this region and in Western Queensland everywhere um, in the last few years in particular with the lack of rain and we have had some tussocks die it means that the land condition has naturally slipped to B it's not anyone's fault that's just what's happened so um, it just means looking after it in the recovery phase will be vital to getting it back to that A condition and can be done fairly easily so moving from B to C means there'll be a little bit more effort required to return to that B condition and you could take could take some more time and require a bit of a bigger change in management. And then as you can see, moving from C to D can be a fairly quick process, but once you're in D condition, it's very difficult to get back to C. And often you can't do this with grazing management alone. You need some kind of mechanical intervention and it might not even be possible, especially if your soil condition has deteriorated too fast. So if you've got a loss of topsoil and now you've got a clay pan, it can be very hard. Um, so basically the crux of the message is try and keep it in A and B. Um, and if it slips to C, don't let it go to T. So just once I've covered land condition, it's importance. I just wanted to talk about how we balance stock numbers to ensure we don't impact that land condition from our grazing activities. So assessing stock numbers uh, can be done in two ways for our property or our paddock. The first is a long-term current capacity. So this is how many animals a paddock or property 
if it's fairly uniform, you might want to do it on property scale, but can carry over the long term. So the average stock numbers, um, yeah, and we use land types, climatic conditions, land condition, and tree density to sort of come up with this average figure of our long-term carrying capacity. So an example might be those figures you hear um, in general for your region. So we know that a certain land type can carry a certain amount of stock. So for the Mitchell grass, you know, we hear one sheep to 2.5 acres, 3.5 acres, um, and whatever it is in your region. So that average figure is across a wide range of years at long-term carrying capacity. So to come up with yearly fluctuations in pasture growth and availability, we look more at the short-term carrying capacity. So this is refining the stock numbers based on what we have on the ground that year, and forage budgeting is a tool that we use to do this. And for those of you that may be a bit more visual, um, just in a bit more of a, yeah, a visual way, the blue line is that long-term carrying capacity. So generally, I mean, this is obviously quite linear, but it won't change a lot. You could, if the land condition slides down, that, that blue line could slip down, or if you improve land condition, it could slide up. But generally, it stays around the same. And then the red line is the short-term carrying capacity. So it moves up and down on that long-term average, depending on the season and the feed that we've grown in that particular year. So you can see it fluctuates. And we can't plan that out long-term because we have to wait and see what our season brings us. So just to recap, why would we do a forage budget? Basically, to match the stock numbers to available pasture um, and to assess whether that pasture will meet our animal requirements. And then ensure that the utilisation of the pasture won't impact land condition outcomes. So ensuring that we're leaving enough pasture there to allow the grass to respond to that next rain, keep a healthy root system and grow us a good bulk of feed. So just into some of the more technical aspects um, of the forage budget, it seems like I'm jumping around a bit, but <laughs> hopefully it all comes together in the end. Um, but I just wanted to start here with adult equivalents. So having different classes of stock on the property can make it a little difficult to compare them all as they weigh different amounts and they eat, eat different amounts. So I'm sure some of you will come across this term, but I'll explain it just in case not. Um, so for instance, if you have 500 breeders and 200 weaners, how would you compare one to the other when you're thinking about how long the feed you have will last them when they're quite a different animal and the amount of pasture they consume will vary greatly. So to better enable us to compare one type of animal to another type, we use these adult equivalents. So it's similar to bringing things back to a per hectare or a per acre type of value. So adult equivalents are a standard way to refer to different classes of animals and the amount that they will be eating. And it allows us to compare these different classes um, with each other. So for cattle, the standard um, one adult equivalent is a 450 kilo steer at maintenance. So that's not gaining or losing weight. And for sheep, the standard animal is a 50 kilogram weather, also at maintenance. Um, and we call that a dry sheep equivalent. So I'm sure everyone down south, they tend to use um, DSCs more for um, cattle as well. And so for anyone that needs to do the sum for both species, if you've got sheep and cattle, one AE equals nine DSC. So I could have one 450 kilo steer, or instead of that, I could have nine 50 kilo weathers. Um, so just a little table to show some of these comparisons. As you can see, the second column is the adult equivalent value and the third column is the dry sheep equivalent value. So just an example from this table, the weaner there at the top of the list, even though it's less than half the weight of that 450 kilo steer, it's a little bit over half an AE. And this is because these animals are growing um, and they eat more to meet their requirements as they grow. So basically, if I wanted to stock my paddock using this table, I could have one 450 kilo steer, or I could have about two 200 kilo weaners, or I could have nine 50 kilo weathers, or six or so lactating ewes. So I get that I'm going through the sums of that table a bit quick, but um, 
but that's basically how you use it. You're just comparing how many of each class of stock you could have. Um, and as you can see, for any any late pregnant or lactating females, we add 0.3 to any AE rating. So I'll just get my pointer. Hang on. So um, even if the lactating cow weighs 450 kilos, she ends up at 1.3 AEs because we've just got to factor in that she'll eat more and need more for those requirements. <clears throat> so how much will an animal eat? Um, and what we're, what we're trying to do with all of this is work out what our standard animal will eat. Um, and then we can extrapolate that across our other animals. So intake is affected by the quality of the feed and the weight and class of the animal. The lower the quality of the feed, generally the lower the intake. So um, generally intakes over the year on pasture are between 1.5 to 2.5% of body weight. Um, in the in if you've got frost blackened or end of season feed, you might only consume 1.5 to 1.8 percent. They just physically can't get it through the rumen fast enough. And if if it's in the lush green feed during the growing season, it might be more like 2.5 percent of body weight because they can digest it much much more quickly. Um, and feedlot rations could be up to three percent. So we don't have to worry about that in this because we're not budgeting a feedlot ration. So while it is important to try and estimate intakes with some kind of accuracy, an average you could use for the forage budget is that generally an AE across the year would eat about 10 kilos a day. So that's about 2.2% of their body weight. Um, <clears throat> and this is 12.7 kilos of dry season grass. So just to give you a bit of a visual idea of what around about 10 kilos of grass looks like. Um, so the only other aspect to think about um, when we're talking ab about intakes is the increase in intake a result of protein supplements. So protein supplements such as urea or cottonseed meal will increase the rate at which the dry grass passes through the rumen. So there's more gut bugs there to break down the feed. So this in turn means the animal can eat more. So it's a good thing for production, but we also just need to make sure that we factor it in when we do a forage budget. So the increase is usually in the range of 10 to 30 percent and it's not really an exact science when calculating it but generally the lower the quality of the feed the greater the effect on intake. So for example in the early dry season when pasture still has decent protein and energy levels intake might only increase by 10 percent but this could go right up to 30 percent by the end of the dry season when the quality is very low, as normally it would take them a long time to digest that pasture. Um, so if you're going to factor it in to your forage budget, I'd suggest maybe using 20% as a value to cover you for a budget that would take in the whole dry season. Um, if you like to be conservative, you could potentially set it at 30%. Um, and if you're doing your forage budget for a shorter period of time, then you just might need to work out the value that would that would suit the time of year that you're budgeting for. So I've gone through a few things pretty quick there. So I'm just going to pause for some questions in case anybody has any. Okay, thanks, Kiri. Um, so this is over to everyone now, your opportunity to ask Kiri any questions on what she's presented so far. Uh, we will be having a final uh, question time at the end of the presentation. So if you have any questions at the moment, please feel free, just type them in and I can ask them out. So one of the questions that came in, Kiri, was uh, could um, those on today's webinar get a template budget? Yes. Yep. And we'll go through that a bit later on as well. Um, and then with on the slides, there's one there as well. Yep. Okay. Another question. Uh, the DSC calculation is different for merinos versus dorpers or shedding sheep or traditional <laughs> meat breeds. Yes, that was based on merinos. Um, that's basically what we mostly have up here. So yeah, most of my figures are for those merino sheep and I do grant that dorpers and some of those meat breeds definitely have different grazing habits. Um, and that would be where I probably would send people back to the New South Wales um, DPI type websites because they'll certainly have more um, data on that than we would up here in Queensland. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, another quick question. A roux is given at 0.36 of a DSE. Some farmers believe they eat more than a third of a sheep. Is there good evidence to support the DSE figure? Mm, I would say not on kangaroos. We don't have a lot of good data on roos, so we all are just working with what we can work with. But yeah, there's not a lot of great data for us to um, really say that a roo is is exactly that. Um, so no, we just have to go with what we've got in our best guess. But if you, in your budget, wanted to up um, the DSE rating on a roo, then that would certainly make it more conservative. So you can do that if you'd like to, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you for that. Uh, another uh, quick query question, uh, similar to one previously. Um, will the table for the AE equivalents be also available? Uh, the one that's on the slides, yes, but I'd recommend um, if you'd want a more detailed AE table that Future Beef or would be probably the best place to search for it. And I'll show you some Future Beef references at the end, um, but that'd probably be the best way to get a more robust AE table. I, I will make a note that I can put that in my follow-up email to everyone to give you the link to the Future Beef webpage um, for all the AE calculations. So um, yeah, I'll put that, everyone, I'll just put that into my, my uh, follow-up email to you. Um, Okay, another quick question, Kiri. What level of digestibility or megajoules ME would be equivalent to a 2.5% intake for cat cattle? Oh, so probably up there in the wet season. So, yeah, more like 8 or 9 megajoules of ME um, and protein, yeah, around the same, if you could even get that high. It depends what pasture you're on, really. But yeah, certainly, certainly in that lush green part of the wet season, phase one growth. Okay. Um, do you include another question? Do you include trace minerals which your paddock might be deficient in when calculating a forage plan? No. At the moment, we're just looking at whether or not the available pasture will meet their intake requirements. And so then you can go one step further and start looking at nutritional requirements. But basically the forage budget is looking at whether or not it will meet the amount that they need to physically ingest every day. And then you'd need to balance it out after that. Okay, got time for a couple of quick questions. Uh, are your intake weights total kilograms or dry matter intake? Dry matter intake. And I'll get onto that in a, in a bit as well. Yep, dry matter intake. All right. Wonderful. One last quick question, and I know there's a few others here in front of me, and we can I can ask uh, some of those uh, at the end. So, uh, does feeding a protein supplement increase our shrink rate during transport due to the increased rate of passage? Well, oh, that's a really good question. <laughs> um, well, it well it could on your yeah on your gut feel yes. I suppose the answer to that is yes. Um, I don't think it's going to greatly impact it on a on a journey with the amount of gut fill on that particular day, but it could have some impact. Yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, just conscious of time, we might just continue with the presentation. Over to you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, so on to completing a forage budget, and hopefully some of this will answer some of those earlier questions as well. Um, but generally there are two main components to the supply side of the forage budget. So uh, the total pasture yield and the unpalatable or unusable pasture. And the difference between these two is the total useful pasture that we can use for grazing. So I will say here for anyone with sheep, We'll run through this and it can still be done as a guide, but as you know, sheep have quite different grazing behaviour. So it's a little harder to budget, especially if you have a lot of herbage around like we have out here this summer or some of the more annual species, you know, they'll eat them first and then go to your bigger tussocks. So it's a little different for sheep, but a good place to start is with a forage budget like this. So to start with, we have this total pasture yield. So that's all the growth we can see for that plant or in the paddock. Um, and then we start to take out the other aspects that we can't use. 
So detachment, so that's anything that will be trampled, leaf drop, insect consumption, etc. For anyone that has Flinders grass or some of those annuals, this is particularly relevant as you know when those grasses late in the season just crumble or blow away um, when they, they've hayed off, that's certainly your detachment. We set it as an average at 15, but if you had a lot of flinders, you might want to up that to 20, 25% if you know that it's just going to blow away on you. Um, then we have the unpalatable feet. So this is unpalatable species and any dead material. So the grey stuff um, from last year, the wire grasses that won't get eaten, anything like that, we take that out. And then we set a desired residual. And this is how much you want left in the paddock at the end of the budgeting period to ensure a good level of ground cover and that the grass is um, sort of a sufficient height for a quick response when the rain comes. So the growing points of some plants, especially buffel and Mitchell grasses are above the base of the tussock. So you need that little bit of height to get it started. So usually around 800 to 1200 kilograms of dry matter is a good residual. Um, but it will depend on the pasture species, your, the condition of the pasture and your particular management goals. So, you know. Um, and one thing to note here too is that we don't want to double count the old unpalatable pasture twice. So if you have a lot of old material in the pasture and part of that will make up the residual that you'll leave after grazing, don't count it again in the unpalatable section. So this was and is still relevant out here in particular in this region. In the last few years when we had that old, those old dry dead stalks in the Mitchell grass that we would be leaving anyway. So we used that as the residual and didn't count any of that in the unpalatable section. So I realise it's a bit confusing over a webinar to check if everyone <laughs> understands that. But um, yeah, just make sure you don't double count any of that unpalatable feed. Um, and then basically when we've taken all them out, we get what's left <coughs> for grazing. So how to get this total yield? Well, we have a couple of ways we can do this. So the first is to use the relevant photo standard sheet as a guide to estimate um, that yield. And these can be found on the Future Beef website and I'll, I'll give you the link later. And they are available for a large range of land types. You can see here there's one for black spear grass, there's one for Mitchell grass, there's one for hard gidgee, there's one for cloncurry buffle. Um, so you can use this as a guide to estimate your own yield. Um, for, the, for the guys down south, um, obviously these land, these sheets are all Queensland based and northern based, but um, you know, with some of those pastures where you can get your, your um, pasture ruler out a bit easier and, and work out your yield um, is somewhat helpful. So that's option one. And as you can see, you just use the photo here and you go, yeah, mine looks about like that. So it must be about that or it looks in between them and just get a bit of an estimate of what your yield might be. Uh, the other option is option two. And you can go out in the paddock and take, and take a number of cuts. Um, so using this method, you'd get, a, you'd get your little helper there with a bag and you'd get a uh, one metre square quadrant and you take a number of cuts, weigh them and then with some calculations I'll show you, you can work out how much pasture you actually have in that whole paddock. So if the density is reasonably uniform, if the density of pasture that is, is reasonably uniform in the paddock, you can do a number of cuts in a straight line. So you might just walk a straight line and take five to ten cuts along it as you go to get a good sample. So you might take 50 steps between your cuts um, and get five to ten cuts. Um, if the density is a little bit more variable, say, and you have some areas with a high yield and some with a low yield, then you can be a bit more selective on where you take cuts and do it a bit more strategically and get samples from the various areas and then bring that together to reflect the whole paddock. So if you're taking pasture cuts, then you'll need to do some weighing and drying and some calculations to turn this into your yield information. So step one, I'll take you through the steps here and obviously you'll get the slides so you can have a look at this again later. Um, but step one is to take a wet weight. So important to make sure you tear the scale so you only measure the pasture weight. So if you put your pasture into a bag, make sure you tear off a bag so that you're only uh, measuring the grass. Um, and then you can dry it. You can do it in an oven if you like or the easy way to do it that most people have is dry in a microwave. So 
Hot tip, do it at two minute intervals with a cup of cold water um, and discard the water after each two minute drying interval. So otherwise it'll get too hot and you'll it will hinder your um, drying. But if you don't have the water, then you'll end up with a very stinky microwave and it's been done before. So I recommend definitely remembering the water and just keep doing that until the weight stabilizes. So if you're getting down to where it's changing by a gram or something, then you've, you've probably gone as far as you can go with this method. Um, and then take a dry weight. So again, remember to tear those scales so that you're only measuring the partial. And then what you'll do is calculate the percentage of the dry weight. So this, we want to get the percentage of moisture and, and vice versa, we want to get the dry matter percentage of the pasture. So, so this calculation, yeah, dry weight divided by wet weight times 100 is your dry matter percentage of pasture. And you can use this in future to work out your average dry matter percent of pasture that, that you didn't dry and waste. So say if you did this once for one paddock and the others were fairly uniform, you wouldn't have to take samples or you wouldn't have to dry the others. You could just take the samples, weigh them and then work it out based on the percentage of dry matter, um, the dry matter yield of that pasture. And then finally, because we've only done it per quadrant, we then have to work it out on a hectare basis. So um, take your dry weight times 40. That's if you're using a one square meter quadrant, if you're using a different size than <laughs> to consult your local mathematician. Um, and yeah, so times it by 40 and that will give you a figure per hectare. So I'll just go through some examples. So we, we took a number of samples um, in the paddock say we took five cuts and we've weighed them and we dried them and these are our dry weights that we're left with here. So our total divided by five, so the average dry weight is 80.4 grams. So total dry matter per hectare, 80.4 times 40, 3,216 kilos of dry matter per hectare. Um, and then say we, we did that um, and we wanted to go out and collect more samples, but we didn't want to spend all the time putting water in the microwave. Um, we decided that they were 80% moisture, 80% um, dry matter, sorry, 20% moisture. So our total average wet weight is 100.5. And if we assume that dry matter is 80%, um, so 100.5 times 40, the total amount of pasture there was 4,020 kilograms per hectare. And if we times that by 80%, 3,216 um, kilos per hectare of dry matter. As I say, these <laughs> slides will come out if you aren't writing fast enough. Um, and yeah, so just to recap, we're finding that total yield and then we're taking out all the unusable feed and then we're left with what is available for our animals for grazing. So on to completing the forage budget. So I'm going to go through this, not too much depth, because as I mentioned at the start, that could take an hour in itself, but I'll just go through the various areas. Um, and this is where you, you can have a copy of this um, template for later. So we start with the paddock area and the length of time we want the forage budget to cover. So um, we've got this paddock area here. We set our start and end date, work out the number of days um, between them. And then we move on to the classes of animals. So we turn these, so we've got various classes of animals and we turn this into an AE figure um, so that we can compare different classes of stock if we need to later. So you'll note your entry weight, your exit weight. If they changed, you'd get an average of the two and that would be how you work out your adult equivalent. Um, if you do it based on the fact that of their start weight, then you may not fully um, take into account their AE rating. Um, then next we add in the, the pasture information um, and figure out the amount of available pasture that we have for grazing. So you can see our start yield, detachment, unpalatable species. Again, if that's counted in your residual, don't count it here. Um, unpalatable 3P species, so that's your wire grasses or any type of grass that they just won't touch or weeds or anything. Um, <clears throat> and then there's a section here for anticipated growth. So in the north here, I usually leave this blank unless you can be really sure that you're going to get some extra growth. Um, obviously, as you know, usually over the dry season, that's rare. 
and perhaps it's more of a bonus than a given. So I generally leave that as zero, and if you get some, great. And if not, when you haven't done yourself out of some feed. Um, so that's that. This end bit here is of what's available um, for our animals to graze. Um, and then we calculate the animal demand. So this is where you'll need to factor in the extra intake if you're using supplements. Um, otherwise, you can just use the standard 2.2% to keep it simple for yourself. Um, and that gives you about 10 kilos per AE per day in your total demand. And then lastly, calculate some of the results. So these will tell you how many days the feed will last with the current numbers of AEs you're wanting to run. So how many... We wanted to run 573 and it would last 260 days. Um, or alternatively, it can tell you the number of AEs it could be run till the end date. So this could end up being more or less what you had originally. Um, so it said here we could run 552 and we wanted to write, run 573. So we're a bit over uh, what it's suggesting. And then it also tells you the amount eaten as a percentage of useful pasture. And I'll just sit on that one there for a minute because I'll come back to that. So. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. But that is your forage budget done. Um, so timing of, for of completing a forage budget. So the best time is at the end of the growing season when you know that no more growth is likely to occur and what you have on the ground is what you can work with. Um, you can also do a follow-up one in the middle of the dry season if you like to reassess um, you know, how it's going is it, are they eating more or less of what you thought? And, you know, you can make some further stocking or restocking decisions. If you're into second round muster, you might be able to take some off or if by chance there was an opportunity to buy some. Um, if you're going to budget for the whole of the dry season, I'd recommend budgeting four to six weeks after your first expected rainfall. So, if, so that would be what we'd call a green date. So if you budget only to the green date, basically the cattle may not have enough grass when the growth first starts after rain. Um, if you budget four to six weeks after this, you'll ensure you have enough feed, one, if there's a late start to the season, and two, up until the point where there's enough feed um, for the cattle to be at maintenance, so not losing weight like they do in that late dry season, or be putting on weight, and we call this a production point. Um, so really recommend probably budgeting out to the production point. And it's important to know your green date and production point. So I'll show you um, some places you can find that at the end as well. Um, so you, if you don't want to budget out to the end of the dry season, then you can always just put whatever length of time you like in your budget. So if you wanted to use it within 10 days and stock it at a high rate, that's okay too. Um, so you just, the import, Sorry. So you just set the dates that you want in the forage budget um, and use this to calculate how many AE can be carried over that period with the available pasture. So that was, you just set your days here um, at whatever days you want and then you just use that to work out how many AEs you could carry till that end date and then work backwards. Um, and the important thing is that when you get down to your set residual level that you take the stock off and you allow it to rest until the rain comes again if you're going to do it this way. So if that's 20 days that it's taking you to use it or 100 days, it doesn't matter as long as you stick to the residual you set and you rest it then until, until that, um, that rainfall and it starts growing again. So lastly, I just wanted to cover some animal production considerations when doing a forage budget. And yeah, this is still not really getting into that nutritional requirements as such. Um, but it's just about if we're using more than 30% of that available useful pasture, then we do start to impact animal production. Um, and basically, this is because animals are less able to select the more nutritious leafy parts of the plant and tend to end up with more stalk and stem and less digestible parts. So we can see here in the example, um, before that it was 51% that they were eating. Um, so obviously that's over our 30% threshold, so it should just raise a little bit of a red flag. Um, it can be done, but it would potentially be eating into that desired residual that you wanted. Um, and so the way to combat that is to reduce the numbers to bring it back down to 30% or 
if you're going to keep going with it, perhaps plan um, some supplementation that would help them better utilise that that less high quality feed. Let's go back. Um, and as mentioned, it has been a bit of an issue in drought affected regions in the last few years where our growth hasn't been great and we have had to use that old feed where possible because, um, yeah, that's just what, <laughs> that's what we've had to do with that was all was available. But it has decreased diet quality and animal performance. So we've just had to factor that in, um, in that. Um, and so finally, there's some resource to assist um, with getting started a bit more with forage budgeting. So Cole Payton um, has some, Cole Payton from, used to be with the department at Roma, now with Eco Rich, has some fantastic YouTube videos. There's about four videos and they're split up into short 10 minute type of videos and they're in depth on how to complete a forage budget and it'll take you through it step by step. So they can be found at that link there. I'd really recommend having a watch of them. Um, the pasture photo standards to assist with the yield calculation. So they can be found at that link there on the Future Beef website as well. Um, for climate and pasture information and reports specific for your property, you can look at the forage tool so this includes rainfall, pasture growth reports, and these are historical and there's outlooks. Um, and that'll probably help you work out your green date and production point. Um, you'll see when the rain is likely to occur. So yep, the forage tool. And then obviously a stock take workshop. So that's a one day training workshop, which would go goes through um, forage budgeting in a lot more depth and land condition monitoring and it's a practical yeah practical based workshop so a lot of stuff out in the paddock actually utilizing the skills so um, you can either find that if any of those are running on the future beef website events tab or contact your local extension officer and if they're not running one they might be able to organize one and that's pretty much it are there any other questions okay thanks Kerry um, again, this is our final uh, question period, everyone. So if you have any questions, please feel free. Just type them in and um, I can ask Kiri um, the question and get a response for you. Uh, one other question coming in, Kiri. Are you measuring feed intake on a, well, we know you're measuring feed intake on a dry matter. What about feeding fatigue on lush green feed? <laughs> we don't have that trouble in Queensland. Um... I hear what you, are you, uh, yeah, I'm not exactly sure of the question, but I assume you may be referring to when they're walking around trying to pick up green pick and they physically can't get enough, maybe, or it's just going straight through them. And obviously, <laughs> yep. I think it's they're, they're, they're eating a lot and they ended up getting, you know, tired. Oh, uh, yep. Yeah, I don't know how you... I don't know how you get around that. And as I say, a lot of this forage budgeting stuff is mostly over the dry season. Yeah. Um, I mean, even though we use that 2.2 because it's a yearly thing. Um, yes, good question. Not really sure how to answer it, actually. <laughs> okay, that's all right. In terms, um, of, in terms of forage budgeting. Yep. Mm. Uh, when, another question. When cutting pasture samples, how low do you cut? Do you only go as low as you want? the animals to graze, which is you know, the residual plant height? Uh, no, cut the whole lot. No, cut the whole lot and then you'll take out that residual out of that because you want the total amount of pasture available. So, yeah, cut, so, so cut right you're down. Basic, you're basically cutting down to the soil height? Yep. 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 Okay. Take it all. Okay. Okay. Another question. Uh, do you have a method of estimating an overall pasture yield in large paddocks with variable pasture types across it? Yes, and I didn't get into that, but it's called an accessible yield sheet. Um, so that was where, pa uh, back when the second option of cutting pastures is where you'd sort of select out your different areas of density. Um, it's, a, uh, it's a little bit complex, but basically, yes, you can allocate the size of each of those regions within a paddock and on a percentage basis and you can work out the yield in each of those areas and then using that percentage work out the yield over the whole paddock. It's called an accessible yield sheet. Um, Barthi perhaps we can 
send that out um, with the yeah, that's, with that's the okay. so, follow up. So everyone, an accessible yield sheet is is getting down to technicalities or when you're doing it across the entire paddock, which you're taking in different land types, uh, which will have different uh, pasture growth in them to evaluate it over an entire paddock. I can see a better mm. look at um, giving you an indication of what the accessible yield sheets in case you want to do it on a paddock base. Okay. Yep. Okay. And that's Another where I'd question. probably chat to some of the DAF people, get them out yep. to give you a hand. Yep. 